Welcome to the Road Centre podcast. My name is Mark Blythe. I'm the Director of the Road Centre for International Economics and Finance at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. I'm delighted to have with us today Luke Messack, who is an emergency room doctor who, despite that, has written, or perhaps because of that, has written a wonderful book that's just come out with Oxford University Press entitled No More to Spend, Neglect in the Construction of Scarcity in Malawi's History of Healthcare. Luke is an emergency room doctor, but he's also someone who's got a PhD in history and the sociology of science from the University of Pennsylvania, and that's how this book came about. So when I think of doctors doing their medical training, I think of people working 70 hours a week, and then some of them go off and do PhDs simultaneously. So chapeau, and very impressed. But what's also very impressive is the book. So welcome, Luke. Let's, uh, let's get into the book. Thanks so much for having me. Really grateful to be here. So the key idea here, let's get this on the table right at the start, is the social construction of scarcity. Now, usually we think of doctors, you think of science and empiricism. There's not much social construction going on there. But you take this very seriously. Constraints can be very flexible things. And oftentimes, yeah, there's a limited amount of money because that's because you put your money somewhere else. You actually have other priorities. You're just not fessing up to the priorities. So when we think of Malawi, which is very much a hard case in the sense that this is one of the poorest places on the planet, you nonetheless make a convincing case that runs for almost 100 years that what's going on here is something that isn't just simply constraints. There's a lot of constructing those constraints for political ends. So just give us an overview. What do you mean by the construction of scarcity and why do you think it's important in understanding global public health? Yeah, the reason why I focus on scarcity is because it is the overarching ethos in global public health. The first and last thing you learn in any course on global public health is that we've got scarce resources. We've got to apportion them as well as we can. The utilitarian ethos is strong uh, and a lot of your learning and your, your thought process will be directed towards how do we best use the limited financial resources that we have. But one of the benefits of history is that we get to look more broadly and say, well, where did this scarcity come from? Is it in fact inevitable. And one of the things I realized in the course of doing this research was that even in Malawi, one of the poorest countries in the world, there was often more money to be found. This idea of the social construction of scarcity came into being because while I I do, like a doctor, like to focus on the hard facts and the hard evidence, I couldn't help but notice that this refrain, there was no more to spend, we have scarce resources, we live in settings of scarcity, this is a resource limited setting. These refrains became seen as natural law, partly as a result of how often they had been repeated and repeated over again, even though, as the history historical records showed, there was more to be spent, there was more to be found. So I was interested in how this became kind of a an unchallenged mantra in global health, even though it it isn't really supported by the record. What's really cool about the book is it shows how this emerges as a strategy of control in the colonial era. But the fact that you then move through the Federation period, which is nearly the post-colonial era, then into the era of independence, and essentially it continues right across, suggests that this is a very, very powerful dynamic that isn't just tied to material conditions, or at least the material conditions are not what you've been led to believe. One of the reasons that poor countries are often told that they can't spend on healthcare is because, well, you've got too much debt. And that was certainly true of Malawi or as it was in the 1920s. And that came because of a railway, which was basically a giant confidence trick. Can you walk us through this one? Yeah. So during the colonial era, Malawi, what is today Malawi, was then called Nyasaland. It was a British protectorate. And in the 19, late 19 teens, actually, at the end of World War I, there was an idea that was floated by a Belgian financier named Libert Ori kind of a shadowy figure. It's kind of hard to find a picture of him or even to get more details on his life. Even during his life, he was known as kind of this figure behind the scenes who had a lot of connections to British colonial officials. And he was able to convince them at a series of luncheons and banquets and whining and dining to build a railway through land that he owned in Mozambique. And 
not only would they build this railway uh, or give him a loan to 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 build a railway, they would guarantee him a profit on the railway. So even if this railway failed, he would be guaranteed a 6% profit per annum for 25 years. And the responsibility for repaying this loan initially sat with the UK Treasury, but the Treasury insisted that this responsibility would actually lie with the Nyasaland's government and therefore the native population of Nyasaland through their hut taxes. So the problem with the railway was that it was completely uneconomical. It was built as a result of being built through his land. It was actually way too long and uh, to be economical, to, to turn a profit. And so when it failed very quickly after it was completed, those loans fell hard on the backs of Nyasaland's population. And as a result, about half of Nyasaland's revenue for the next quarter century was devoted to repaying this debt, debt that for them had no benefit. So while 6% of Nyasaland's spending was on healthcare during this period, almost half was on this pretty useless loan. And that's a perfect example of then of constraints because essentially they could have spent multiples of what they were doing, instead of which they had to basically pay up for a loan that the British government gave some dodgy Belgian financier. And none of that should have happened, but now that's your responsibility. QED, there's no healthcare spending. Yeah, absolutely. So the language of scarcity, the language of inevitability continued during that period. There was no more to spend. There, there couldn't be any more. There are these plaintive letters from the governor of Nyasaland, from doctors in Nyasaland, from provincial officials that found their way to the UK Treasury, which for much of this period, or for some of this period, was run by Winston Churchill. And uh, the, the response that they always got was always a rebuff saying, you have this debt to repay, you have your own responsibilities, there's really no more for healthcare, no more can be done. But when you look at where that debt came from, it was an odious debt. There was no reason why it should have been taken on in the first place and why it had to constrain spending. So. So yeah, from the from the get go, from the from the from the start, Nyasaland was in a hole. There were moments when the colonial power, the United Kingdom in this case, thought, "Oh, maybe we need to do something about healthcare for the natives," as they called it. And the first instance is during World War One, when, as you describe it, hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children are pressed into the carrier trade, literally carrying twenty or thirty kilos of supplies to British and Allied forces fighting German forces in East Africa during World War One. The entire, if you will, the forgotten front of the First World War. And then in the 1920s, some 10 years later, there are actually people back in London who recognize that this may be more important for producing stability in these countries, if nothing else, than has hitherto been recognized. And they managed to actually open the, open the purse a little bit for this. Can you talk about these two episodes, World War One, and then the reports in the late 1920s and early 1930s? Yeah, there, there were a few moments, a few moments when this stinginess was, was interrupted. And one of them was during the war, as you mentioned, when as a result of the carrier service, there, you know, the, the death rate was, was even in the words of, of colonial officials was disgraceful. And there was very little in the way of any provision made for their safety or life. But one of the things that was done was that these carrier hospitals were built and they are hospitals really in name only. They were thatch roofed huts staffed by nuns with no medical training. And uh, they were they were providing the, the medical care such as it was to the population of carriers. But after the war, one of the few things that Malawians said was one of the few things worth carrying over from the war experience was these hospitals. And so as a result, after some delay, the colonial government built this system of dispensaries around the country, which would provide medical care uh, to the what they called the native population. And that remained the only source of medical care for, for much of the next few decades. And when healthcare did improve slightly in the 1930s and early 1940s, it was in part as a result of these really strongly worded reports that were sent by the director of medical services, first this gentleman named Shurkor and then another one named DeBoer uh, about a decade apart, where they toured the country they took these little tours of the country and said, this is horrific. You know, a lot of, most of them had worked in other parts of East Africa. Some of them worked in India. 
And they said that compared to those other colonial settings, Malawi or Nyasaland, as it was called, was just dismal. That there was very little in the way of training, very little in the way of provision, and that they could not meet their professional standards in any way unless they were provided more. And so partly as a result of their elite protest or elite complaint, they got a measure of more resources. Some new hospitals were built, uh, some new training programs were set up. And even though healthcare spending remained paltry, there was some additional uh, services provided. And it showed that one of the things that can increase healthcare spending is this you know, well-placed elite complaint that there is a role for that in the history of healthcare. We'll get on to that when we talk about AIDS in the 1980s and 1990s. But I want to take us beyond the 1930s into the post-World War II period. There's a very interesting period because you have a reformist Labour government running the United Kingdom. They're not post-colonial. They're not giving up empire. No one's in that mindset yet. We haven't had the East of Suez moment or any of this sort of stuff. But it was meant to be a very different form of colonial governance, a partnership, etc. So in London, the British government is basically saying there are no constraints. We have inherited a gigantic debt after World War II, but we're not going to do austerity. Instead, we're going to nationalise industries, improve pensions, build a national health service, and basically transform the state. You would expect the British Labour government to take a similar attitude towards colonial governance. They said that they were going to do this, but they did the exact opposite. Once again, they brought in the language of constraints. Can you talk about that period and how they did that? Yeah, you you mentioned how this was a transformative moment in the UK. It was a moment of tremendous hope in the colonies too. The colonial populations read the Beveridge Report too. They were inspired by this war on want and war on disease that it promised. And they expected the same. And it's, they had reason to expect it. The Labour government promised the end of imperialism as we know it. They promised developmentalism as the new le legitimate reason for the continuation of colonial rule. And so when they talked to colonial officials, they when they went to hospitals, they expected more. And this was also the era where medicine itself became much more capable that we had new medicines. We had penicillin, streptomycin, chloroquine. So much more was possible in medical care, um, but it wasn't reaching the colonies. And part of the reason is visible when you look at the Labour Party's own discussions amongst themselves about, well, why weren't x-ray machines making their way to the colonies when they were finding their way to British hospitals? And it was because this language of scarcity found its way in again. They were saying, well, if we end up spending our money on the colonies, then we're going to lose popular support in the, in, among domestic populations. We're going to lose elections. And that would be even worse for the colonies. So really, it's in the colonies' interest for us to focus on the domestic, you know, focus on the UK and get, get what we can to the colonies. But we can't go overboard here. So this language of scarcity found its way in again, even at this moment of, of tremendous rhetorical change. So before we get to the post-colonial era and the independence era in Banda, there's a strange interregnum, the federation with southern Rhodesia, which understandably the citizens of Malawi at that point were not exactly in favour of being run by the most avowedly white supremacist government on the planet. But nonetheless, they gave it a go. And what that did was quite interesting. It provoked, unsurprisingly, civil resistance. There were riots. There was political mobilization. And in response to that, the strangest thing happened. More healthcare spending. What's the connection? I think it's a direct connection. The, the government was, as you said, ruled, came to be ruled by Southern Rhodesia. London basically handed control over to Southern Rhodesia for this federation that would, in essence, save London money. Um, by, by handing over responsibility to Southern Rhodesia. And Malawians hated this idea. I mean, if they didn't like rule from London, they certainly didn't like rule from Salisbury. This was even worse. And so these, these riots hit the streets. And as a result, a lot of voices in London were saying, well, look, what are we doing? Perhaps this is, isn't actually in the interest of Malawi's population. There was a, lot, a rising anti-colonial tide. And, and uh, even, in, even in London, there was a lot of concern and dissent about this decision. But in order to continue this arrangement, which Southern Rhodesia definitely wanted to do because they saw it as a way to continue the rule in their own country, uh, they said, no, wait, we're actually providing a lot for Malawi. And the thing that we're providing the most of is healthcare. Uh, 
we are protecting the health of the population. We're providing vaccines, we're providing hospitals, we're providing medical care, the likes of which they've never seen before. And they actually were providing more than London ever did. It wasn't much in absolute terms, the, the, and it was, certainly wasn't much in terms of what they were providing to the white population in Southern Rhodesia and Malawi, but the native population, as they called it, was receiving more. Um, in part because they were trying to answer these concerns about legitimacy that that perhaps they would lose rule altogether if they didn't do more. Now, eventually they do lose out. I mean, res- resistance and anti-colonial struggles affects the entire continent. Malawi's no exception. We get then into the Banda era. He's a fascinating character, a bit of a globe-trotting entrepreneur <laughs> with a dodgy background, and a doctor And you would think that the conditions would be right for a doctor, the clues in the name, coming home, becoming the kind of figurehead president, making healthcare a priority, doing more with whatever we've got, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not what happens at all. So why then? Why does he fail to pick up this ball? Yeah, I think perhaps it's the obverse of what you saw during the Federation period. Malawi becomes independent. Banda becomes president, then president for life. He's able to consolidate rule to the extent that there's a lot of political quietus in the country. And so he doesn't have to worry too much about challenges to his rule, at least for the first few decades. And his personal priorities are otherwise. He builds personal palaces. He moves the capital city to his home district. He really wants to build a new international airport. And with the money he has, he focuses on those resources. Meanwhile, the UK wants out They provide some resources, but they say they don't want to be providing financial assistance any longer than they have to. So they provide for a few few years and then they're they're out. Uh, But he wasn't averse to taking someone else's money to provide for health care. There's the lovely example of the Gulbenkian Foundation from Portugal. Can you talk about that? Yeah, he had an interesting position in in world affairs. Among uh, countries ruled... Uh, by majority populations in Africa. So I'm, I'm exempting, uh, you know, white world governments in, uh, in South Africa and Portugal and, and uh, Southern Rhodesia. Among the other countries in Africa that were independent, Malawi was alone in not standing against apartheid South Africa. Uh, they, they continued to support Portuguese rule in Mozambique. They continued to support uh, white rule in Southern Rhodesia. And as in part in recompense for that loyalty to these pretty odious regimes, Banda said that he wanted some financial support. And so he went to the Gulbenkian Foundation, which is this private foundation in Portugal that was allied with the Portuguese government. And he said, you know, I'm very friendly with your government. I support you in the UN. I always speak speak in your favor, even as all my neighbors are allied against you. And so in, in, in recompense, perhaps you could provide some money for healthcare. And so he opened this hospital in Dedza using the foundation's money. And he, he bragged about this uh, bribe, perhaps, at, at, his, uh, at the hospital opening. So, yeah, he, he did make use of his unique political position uh, in providing some modicum of healthcare to the population. So once we move into the post banda era, as we're getting there, this is when AIDS becomes uh, a massive global public health crisis. And Malawi is one of the countries that sits very, very hard with the AIDS crisis. So there's two things going on at this juncture, which I, I want to talk about. The first one is, again, the notion of constraints. This is a real constraint. The drugs that you need to basically treat this, antiviral therapies, they're not there initially. And then when they do come online, they're beyond the expenditures of anyone in uh, the whole sub-Saharan African area. So there's the politics of basically how those medicines became effective. But then there's also the fact that it became a global campaign. It was, in a way, the first global health campaign of the modern era. And that led to essentially a kind of celebrity politics around us, which allowed external aid flows to come in in a way that they hadn't done before. So what does the whole AIDS episode of Malawi tell us about constraints in global public health? Yeah, it began with austerity became the buzzword in sub-Saharan Africa, especially in the 1980s and 1990s. You know, there was no money for anything. Uh, privatization was the name of the game. Uh, in, in, in the World Bank, the focus became on charging user fees for healthcare. Um, even as the AIDS epidemic became, ran rampant over the, over the population and Malawi became one of the epicenters of the pandemic, the doctors and nurses spoke about how there was nothing 
that they could do uh, other than preside over the deaths of their patients in the absence of getting the life-saving drugs that were that were saving lives in the U.S. and, and Europe at the very same time. And so, yeah, during the late 1990s and early 2000s, you saw this, this strange kind of interesting agglomeration of AIDS activists and Christian right um, uh, faith leaders and politicians and African activists who helped push for a few things. One was the importation of generic AIDS drugs into Africa, first with South Africa under Nelson Mandela's government over the objections of the United States and brand name pharmaceutical companies. Um, after that success, you know, Brazil did the same thing. Uh, and eventually new funding became available through the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief in the United States and the um, Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. All this new money coming available uh, at a time when before there was only talk of austerity. Now there became talk that it was actually possible to treat AIDS in poor countries, something that had seemed completely impossible and illogical uh, in global health circles only a decade earlier. So it was a new era of possibility, one that gave the lie to a lot of the uh, scarcity talk that had been going on for, for so long. You've just reminded me of something that's at the end of the book, which I nearly fell off my chair when I was reading. You mentioned privatization, which of course was one of the other policies that was very popular with developmental agencies in the 1980s in particular. And there's this incredible sort of little vignette close to the end of the book where you talk about there was a couple of years of crop failures. And normally this would have been relieved by these giant grain silos that the Banda government had built. And they basically bought tons and tons of grain as an emergency reserve that they would then sell at below market prices to make sure no one starved to death. And of course, as part of a, conditional, uh, a condition of refinancing a World Bank or IMF loan, I forget which, which one it was, these things were privatized. So all the grain was essentially sold off to speculators and then mass hunger ensued. It's just such a shocking sort of like, oh my God, you know, yes, privatization makes things efficient. Really? Maybe there's more to life than efficiency. Maybe sort of insurance and robustness might be considered healthcare issues as well. Yeah, if we look beyond healthcare proper, you know, the hospitals and healthcare centers, and, and you look at actually what determines the health of the population, certainly nutrition is a huge source. And even, you know, for all the faults of the Banda regime, one of the things that they were known for was protecting against famine. In fact, he put those grain silos on the currency, right? So you were reminded of the, the work he was doing to protect the population against famine on ever-present concern um, throughout his regime. But those silos, yeah, they were emptied of grain as soon as the agency was, was privatized. And a huge famine ensued. And people spoke about it as the, the time when no one came to help. You know, there was there was no assistance during this period. It's one of, aside from the AIDS epidemic, it's one of the most dismal periods that people recounted to me. And it was completely unnecessary, completely unnecessary. And But it's also one of those examples of we created another constraint by this policy of, no, no, the market will take care of the grain supply. And of course it did. It went off to people who could afford to pay the market rate and it created famine. So again, even the most hard constraint, basically you have nothing to eat, itself has a political origin. Yeah, and, and even to, to prove that even more, a few years later, by the late uh, 2000s, a new president came in and he made uh, subsidies for agricultural fertilizer a huge a huge um, platform in his uh, in his pitch to the population. And in fact, he's, he ended up spending a huge amount of money on it over the objections of the World Bank. And it led to a huge increase in production in agricultural production. And eventually the World Bank said, actually, you know what, perhaps this is a good idea. Perhaps this is something we can live with in perhaps a limited form. So there's, there's, these things are malleable. These things are not inevitable. And, and the, the political history of this one small little country that a lot of us don't think too much about or, or visit can, can throw light on it quite a bit. So let's finish by taking exactly that insight. What can Malawi tell the rest of the world? We're, we're so used to kind of global north conversations whereby we sit around and diagnose and tell them what to do and look at our experiences, how it's relevant to them. You spent time there. 
you worked there as a doctor as well as working there as a historian going through the archives and putting together the research for this great book. So what do you think Malawi tells the rest of the world, the developed North in particular, about constraints and politics? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I was, I was still a medical student at the time, so I wasn't providing direct care, but I did spend a lot of time with patients. Um, and I do think it has a lot to teach us. I mean, if scarcity is at least in part a construction in Malawi, one of the poorest countries in the world, then certainly it is often a construction in other places. And today I'm a, I'm a doctor. I work in emergency departments in, uh, in the United States. I work in Rhode Island. And, you know, there I see as a result of this pandemic in part and people losing their jobs and health insurance, I see all sorts of scarcity, people without enough food to eat, people without the insurance they need to perfor- uh, afford medical care. And the, the language of scarcity returns and we're told that some of it can't be helped when in fact there is, as your work has shown, there's plenty more that can be done. Looking at Malawi teaches us both about, about Malawi and about the broader world and that, you know, it, if, if more can be done there, certainly more can be done here. I think we'll leave it at that point. Congratulations on the book, No More to Spend, Neglect in the Construction of Scarcity in Malawi's History of Healthcare. Even if you don't think you're interested in healthcare, even if you don't think you're that interested in Malawi, honestly, read it. It's a great book. It's a great work of political economy, as well as being about public health and public policy. Thank you very much, Luke. Thanks so much for having me. This episode of the Road Centre podcast was produced by Dan Richards. For more information, go to watson.brown.edu slash roads. Thanks for listening.